Good morning, everyone. It is nine o'clock. Uh, sorry, Karen, I just noticed you were there. Okay? Recording in progress. Okay. Um, please note that there is a copy of the Open Meetings Act on the wall in the back of the legislature, and there is also an uh, automatic external defibrillator in the back of the legislative chamber. Please stand for Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would also like to note that the mask mandate has expired uh, last night. So if you are comfortable, you can remove your mask while you're in the chamber. Um, we ask that you still um, do the social distancing, um, but you can remove your mask if you feel comfortable doing so. Uh, with that, we... Oh, oh, yes. Um, with that, um, Commissioner Rogers has asked for a point of privilege beginning uh, at the meeting, and so Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. I, I just want to um, want to say good morning to everybody, but note, um, as most of you all walk, woke up today, today is the one-year anniversary of the George Floyd uh, murder that happened in um, Minnesota last year at this time. And I just want to note that um, the point of this day and, and where we are a year from now, I know at, when it happened last year and we came to this point, um, I started a file because of just looking at the gravity of statements that were made by organizations around the city and this country, statements from entities that hadn't really put their marker out on issues uh, such as race or structural racism. So even as uh, today is we'll have a presentation today on one of uh, the steps that the one of the, the beginning steps that the county is taking to try to uh, continue this effort. I just uh, ask everybody to reflect on the moment today at one o'clock. I know around in several places they're recognizing um, uh, nine minutes of silence in respect to that effort. But I would like everybody just to keep it on their mind and remember. Um, the promises that were made by some and the things that still need to be done in regards to this day and uh, ask everybody to reflect on the commitments that they made and continue to move forward with that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Rogers. With that, we are going to go into the Douglas County Board of Commissioners um, first and we will do um, the recognition and proclamations and then we will go back to the regular uh, schedule. So with that, roll call for the agenda for the Douglas County Board of Commissioners, please. Commissioner Marine Boyle. Here. I don't see Commissioner Mike Boyle yet, so he's currently absent. Commissioner Cavanaugh. Here. Commissioner Friend. Here. Commissioner Morgan. Here. Commissioner Rogers. Here. Madam Chair. Here. With that, we will move to the recognition and proclamations. And the first one is a resolution recognizing May 2021 as Asian Pacific America Heritage Month. And this was brought to us by Commissioners Kavanaugh and Maureen Boyle. Um, more, which one wants to start? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm happy to join with my colleague, uh, Commissioner uh, Maureen Boyle, uh, to recognize the uh, Asian uh, Pacific uh, Island American Heritage Month uh, that's being celebrated in, uh, in May uh, this year and has been since uh, 1978. And I know that there are uh, individuals from the community um, who want to um, uh, speak in uh, support of this. Uh, I would just like to briefly uh, recap the resolution so that uh, folks in the uh, public listening audience uh, can uh, have a, a full sense of what we're talking about. Uh, whereas Asian Pacific American Heritage Month has been celebrated in the United States since 1978 and has made it into a month-long event in 1992, and whereas Asian Pacific Heri American Heritage Month seeks to honor and recognize the contribution of residents in the U.S. from Asia and the Pacific Islands, and whereas during the month of May we acknowledge acknowledge Asians and Pacific Islanders have lived and worked in our community and have contributed to our economy, culture, education, politics, arts, literature, science, and technological development, 
And whereas Asian Pacific uh, encompasses all of the Asian continent and the Pacific Islands of Melanesia, Micronesia, Nauru, and the Federated States of Micronesia and Polynesia, and whereas native Hawaiians, Chinese, and Japanese were the first to migrate to the Pacific Northwest and were known for handling canoes and transporting goods, construction, and railroad expansion, and whereas during Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, we acknowledge the additional determination, hard work, and perseverance that the Asian Pacific Islander community in the U.S. must put forth to be heard, seen, and appreciated, and that these additional efforts are a result of an equitable, institutional, historic, and system, systemic injustices, and whereas, despite their contributions and leadership, the role of Asian and Pacific Islanders in the U.S. history has been consistently overlooked and undervalued in the literature, teaching, and studying of American history, and whereas Asian and Pacific Islanders have been disproportionately impacted by incidents of racism, hate, and discrimination during the COVID-19 pandemic, and Whereas we hereby recognize and commend that many positive achievements and contrib the, the many positive achievements and contributions of Asian uh, of Americans of Asian and Pacific Islander heritage in education, business, science, the arts, government, and the U.S. Armed Forces, which have strengthened our nation and our Douglas County community. Now, therefore, be it resolved by this Board of County Commissioners, Douglas County, Nebraska that this board hereby recognizes May 2021 as Asian Pacific American Heritage Month in Douglas County, dated this 25th day of May 2021. And I would defer to my colleague, Commissioner Boyle, at this point. Commissioner Boyle. Yep, so, so just briefly, uh, first and foremost, we can't ignore the contributions to science, education, business, and really every aspect of of society uh, that contributions of our uh, Asian Pacific American friends have made to us. So especially in light of the increased incidence of, of violence against against our neighbors, we really put forth this resolution to recognize and support our Asian and Pacific American uh, friends and neighbors. So so thank you for your contributions to, uh, to Douglas County, to society. Um, they, they cannot go unrecognized. Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve the resolution? I would so move. Is there a second? Motion by Commissioner Kavanaugh, seconded by Commissioner Maureen Boyle. Um, I understand there's individuals here. Are there some in the chambers wishing to speak? If you could come forward, please. If you could, uh, sure. Commissioner. We have, we have one uh, individual on the screen, uh, Dr. Ali uh, Khan from UNMC, uh, who we um, are appreciative of him taking time from his busy schedule. As uh, uh, we all know, he's uh, our premier epidemiologist, and during this COVID thing, his time is very precious. We'd ask that, uh, as a point of personal privilege, that he be allowed to go first on the comments, please. Okay, excuse me, ma'am, who came to the podium. If you could just wait for uh, a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, doctor? Good morning and thank you. I'm Dr. Ali Khan at 42nd and Emily Street in Omaha. Uh, I'm here today to celebrate the contributions of the Asian American and Pacific Islanders communities that they have made throughout history and to recognize the County Commission, all of you. Thank you very much for your resolution recognizing May as Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Now, despite historical disc discrimination in the form of exclusion acts, internment camps during World War II, and continued harmful stereotypes such as the model minority, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders have replaced the so-called yellow peril of the beginning of the last century with a golden wave of contributions and innovation to American society. The diversity of this community contributes to the amazing mosaic of culture that distinguishes the United States. Uh, this community represents over 30 different countries speaking 100 different languages. Now, over the centuries of American migration, as you've heard very eloquently by other commissioners, um, the entrepreneurship, cuisine, literature, music, art, cinema, science uh, of these communities has become intertwined and part of American culture. 
this year also has been exceptional in telling the stories of this community. So Disney just released the first ever Southeastern Princess, Raya. Mm -hmm. um, and some of you may know that Marvel will unveil their first Asian superhero, uh, Shang-Chi, uh, later this year. And also as a nation, we elected our first ever vice president of South Asian descent. Now, this amazing uh, impact on our society and progress will not be reversed by individuals who drove a recent anti-Asian hate spree by labeling COVID-19 as the Chinese virus or Kung flu to escape uh, accountability for failed national response. Uh, President Biden signed the COVID-19 Hates Crime Act into law recently, aiming to make the reporting of hate crimes more accessible at both local and national and state levels. Now, unfortunately, discrimination against the AAPI community is nothing new. However, their resilience, determination, and ability to overcome adversity uh, remains. Uh, there's too many famous AAPI individuals to name, but I want to mention one with Nebraska roots. Okay. So in 1965, Patsy Mink was sworn in as the first Japanese woman and woman of color into Congress. However, in her advocacy for the Asian community, uh, that started decades before when she attended the University of Nebraska. Um, she was placed in the International House Dormitory, uh, where only students of colors were allowed to live, even though she was American. Uh, and she started a student coalition there that successfully lobbied to end this segregated housing policy. She also, most importantly for all of us in academia, co-authored the Title IX Amendment of the Higher Education Act, which prohibited gender discrimination in schools. Uh, and after her death in 2002, President George Bush renamed the law after her, the Patty T. Mink Equal Opportunity in Education Act. So let me leave you with two final thoughts. The United States does not exist without the sacrifice and dedication of the AAPI community. And it's long time we recognize differences, uh, not as a weakness, but a strength and something to celebrate. And what I believe is the secret ingredient that has led to making America great. To end, here's a quote from Ms. Pat, uh, Patsy Mink. America is not a country which needs to demand conformity of all its people, for its strength lies in our diversities converging in one common belief, that of the importance of freedom as the essence of our country. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. And Thank you, doctor. Miss, um, there you are. Okay, <laughs> hi. How are you? Hi. If you could just state your name for the record. Good morning. My name is Lorraine Chang, and I'm here representing the Nebraska Asian American Leadership Alliance in support of the county board's resolution to recognize May 2021 as Asian Pacific American Heritage Month in Douglas County. I want to thank Commissioners Kavanaugh and Maureen Boyle for bringing forth this resolution. Thank you. Uh, the resolution appropriately recognizes that people of Asian Pacific descent have made significant contributions to this community and to this country. But why is it that a recent survey found that 42% of Americans could not name a single well-known Asian American? Perhaps it is because, as the resolution acknowledges, Asian Pacific Americans have experienced inequitable institutional, historic, and systemic injustices which have caused many of our contributions to be overlooked and undervalued. We must ensure that our children and families have opportunities to learn about the achievements of Asian Pacific Americans, that our contributions are widely celebrated, and that our voices are heard. Importantly, the resolution highlights the escalation of racism, hate, and discrimination that Asian Pacific Americans have experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, these acts of intimidation and violence have not been limited to Texas and the coasts, but are happening right here in Douglas County. Last February, a bomb was exploded outside the offices of the Nebraska Chinese Association. I know personally of incidents of people yelling racist slurs from cars and leaving hateful notes to people of Asian descent. Much of this recent wave of anti-Asian hate incidents can be attributed to xenophobic messaging related to the COVID-19 pandemic, as Dr. Khan mentioned. Let's set the record straight and use facts to debunk the conspiracies, myths, and stereotypes. It is simply not truthful to scapegoat Americans of Chinese or Asian descent for the actions or inactions of a foreign government. And when hate happens, we must call it out and report it. We cannot be silent. 
Our community benefits when people from diverse backgrounds are welcomed and celebrated for the richness of their ideas, life experiences, and cultures. In addition to declaring that May 2021 be Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, I would like to see this board seek out and amplify the voices of Asian Pacific Americans as it makes its decisions throughout the year. Our organization is happy to help in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? <coughs> Luis Jimenez, 3306 Burt Street. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Uh, I appreciate the resolution. I think it's a very important that we support people that uh, have an impact in the community. I think that we're here because of COVID-19 and because of the pre previous administration uh, blaming the virus as a uh, China virus or what have you. And so the, his followers and, peop and dim-witted people uh, have uh, brought us the, just, just horrible things that we're seeing of, of, of violence and racism. And uh, I bring up the virus because um, it's pr it was predictable that uh, you would elect, that, that this country would elect a president of deplorable qualities and that you, when that happens, you would expect bad decisions to follow. One of the things that former President Donald Trump did was to close down the pandemic response program that President Obama set up, closed m most of the facilities that would, response, or would respond to a, an outbreak. That program was put together so that the country could respond to a small number of cases before they would spread throughout the community. But because Donald Trump is a racist, he shut down the, uh, those facilities and did other things that w were unnecessary. The country was in a course of uh, progress. So I bring up the virus and I also bring up politics because the board is, um, what is it? By it's, uh, it's, it's a partisan board. The Douglas County Board of Commissioners is a partisan board. You are elected as a Democrat or as a Republican. Um, rarely, or probably hasn't happened, that you were elected uh, from a, representing yourself as, as a different party. It's either Democrat or Republican. And uh, unfortunately, the Republicans for whatever reason, saw past Trump's deplorable qualities, and now we're here. And uh, you know, but supporting each other, supporting the community locally, that's a good thing. And I appreciate the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Good morning. <clears throat> Larry Storer, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, 68132. Thank you very much for the presentations. I have a very wonderful young neighbor down the street from me that is Vietnamese. His father was one of those that made it out at the last minute. I am no way, shape, or form a racist. I'm an American. Last week, I was exhilarated for saying some things that I just heard. He should have been called out of order for bringing up the race thing, but since he did, then I will also. As a piece of evidence, you can Google it. On the nightly news, there was video of people of color attacking people of Asian Pacific nationality. Wasn't white people, wasn't me, but once again, they used that to try and paint the narrative that leaves you with the impression that white people, white privileged people are guilty, still guilty. And the other thing I wanna say, 
is I do not have a blog. I am not a community uh, contributor to the Omaha World Herald. This young man here may have a blog. He might be tied to one of the community newspapers. Over the years, I have presented some of those as evidence. Also, to the other side of the story, that we're not all guilty of everything in the past. Yes, there is some racism, but if you're being treated that way, you need to call it out, yes. You need to call it out, charge the person with a crime. This is not a hate crime, but people are trying to make it so. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Um, I I'd just... Like, hi. Where, I'd oh, like oh to there you are. Please. Okay, go ahead. Could you just state your name for the record, please? Yes. My name is Crystal Von Wagner. I'm an American, a Nebraska resident, and an active community volunteer and advocate. I'm also the proud daughter of Vietnamese refugees, an identity which is as much of who I am as a person as is my Americanness. I'd like to thank the Board of Commissioners for allowing me the opportunity to speak on behalf of inclusive communities today and for advancing the resolution. I will start by saying that these short minutes could never be enough to explain the breadth and diversity among the AAPI community and the importance of that recognition. So Inclusive Communities has provided you with a longer email testimony in addition to this one. Asian Pacific Islander American Heritage Month is much more than recognizing that an AAPI population exists in our state. It's about amplifying our communities, our concerns, our experiences, our histories, and sharing our cultural pride. It is also about recognizing the diversity of AAPI people and how we are an essential part of the fabric of American society as a whole. This is not a celebration to set us apart, but to amplify our belonging to society by acknowledging us as teachers, frontline and essential workers, business owners, community builders, friends, neighbors, and families. Diversity is American. Our various heritages strengthen us as a nation and strengthen Nebraska as a state. We represent over 22 million people and over 50 ethnic groups. This diverse representation in our country is arguably one of its best and most unique assets because it is that very vibrance that helps us understand different perspectives, helps us dispel negative stereotypes and biases, and helps us build bridges globally. Celebration should be intentional, consistent, and coupled with learning. API Heritage Month is not for the API community alone. We don't need an obligatory pat on the head for being here, nor do we need momentary acknowledgement due to the current social climate. A celebration of heritage must move beyond that and be elevated in our mainstream society. Celebrating API heritage should be about broadening awareness of the API community, its contributions, and its diversity by elevating our voices and stories, and by making general education and self-education more accessible. It should also be a way of dismantling the stereotypes, myths, fetishization, bias, and violence that the API community has experienced throughout U.S. history that has allowed it to continue today in the context of COVID-19. With the rise in anti-Asian violence and discrimination happening now, yes, it is more vital than ever to elevate the AAPI community and to couple that with the strongest condemnation of past, current, and future acts of discrimination and attempts to silence or subdue our communities. At the same time, anti-Asian discrimination is not new and it will not end unless we do better to educate ourselves on this history. Asian Americans have always been a significant part of this country's society, its history, culture, and economy. We will also play a vital part in America's future. It's essential that recognizing AAPI Heritage Month is not a reaction to discrimination being faced by the AAPI community right now, and instead it should be an intentional measure taken to create a genuine acknowledgement and celebration of the varied AAPI peoples as an important part of American society and as a way of dismantling the harmful stereotypes that allow violence and discrimination to persist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak during this? Yes, please. Uh, okay, go ahead. My name is Gary Nachman. I'm the regional director for the Anti-Defamation League, Plain States, which is responsible for Nebraska, Iowa, and Kansas. And I'm here to celebrate, along with others, the AAPI Heritage Month, which is a celebration of the diversity of this country. 
So I'm going to thank you for the honor of allowing me to make a few remarks in support of this important resolution. I'm proud to be among the citizens of Douglas County, its leaders and advisors who embrace this important message to the world. I'd like to read just a short poem by Martin Niemöller, who was a Lutheran minister, survivor of the Holocaust. First they came for the socialists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. No one should be excluded. Part of the mission of the Anti-Defamation League is to secure justice and fair treatment to all. The commitment of this board goes a long way to repair past wrongs by resolving to secure justice and fair treatment for our neighbors and our fellow citizens. While this proclamation is important, it's not enough without action. We must show that we are allies. An ally is someone who speaks out on behalf of or takes actions that are supportive of someone who is targeted by bias or bullying. An act of allyship, like this resolution, draws a line in the sand for all to see. And I call on all of us to live up to the aspirations of this measure, to hold ourselves and each other accountable to its commitment. Hate against anyone is hate against everyone. We've seen in the last year over 3,800 incidences of uh, anti-AAPI hate incidences, a huge increase uncalled for. On behalf of the Anti-Defamation League, the Jewish community of Omaha, I respectfully request unanimous support of this important resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak? With that, I would just like to make a comment. Um, I thank everyone uh, for being here today and um, expressing yourselves to us. Um, I guess I have two words that are so simple in nature, but sometimes very hard in action. But I would ask all of us as we leave today to please just be kind. Thank you. With that, we do have a motion and a second on the floor for the resolution. Please vote. Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. We'll move to the next proclamation and recognition, and it's recognition of the Douglas County Sheriff's Office Deputy of the Year, the Civilian of the Year, and acknowledging the retirement of Captain Matthew Martin. And here with us today is Sheriff Tom Wheeler. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Tom Wheeler, Douglas County Sheriff. Each year, the Sheriff's Office holds an annual awards dinner where we recognize the outstanding work of our members. Unfortunately for 2020, we weren't able to do that, so I, I wanna say thank you today for allowing us to recognize just a few individuals from the Sheriff's Office. Before you are three resolutions that honor the outstanding work of members of the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. Each year, the Sheriff's Office selects a sworn and civilian member of the department for Deputy of the Year and Civilian of the Year. The winners are selected by the department's command staff for exceptional performance during that year. For 2020, Deputy Chad Miller and Mr. Jason Workman were selected as our employees of the year. Up first is Deputy Miller. If you could join me today. Deputy Miller is assigned to our Criminal Investigations Division where he focuses on human trafficking cases. Between March and May of 2020, Deputy Miller led numerous investigations that identified and investigated suspects who enticed children to perform sexual acts. These investigations involve posting ads for children 15 and under. Deputy Miller would communicate with suspects through text messaging and other social media platforms, posing as an underage minor available for sex. In each case, the suspect responded to the ad, acknowledged that the person posting the ad was 15 years old or younger, 
agreed to a sex act for money and set a time and place to meet with the underage person where the suspect was then apprehended and arrested. The investigations resulted in four suspects being federally indicted on charges that carry a 10-year minimum sentence and two felony warrants being issued for a fifth suspect. I should note that Deputy Miller's work hasn't ended. Most recently, he and the unit he works resulted in three federal indictments on suspects whose victims age ranged from age two to 17. For his tireless dedication to protecting our community from sexual predators, the Douglas County Sheriff's Office recognizes Deputy Miller as our 2020 Deputy of the Year. Please join me in congratulating him. Next is Mr. Jason Workman. Mr. Workman serves as the department's senior chaplain and volunteers his time in that endeavor. In January of 2020, the sheriff's office experienced the loss of one of our deputies to suicide. This tragic death immensely affected many of our personnel, including both sworn and civilian, making it personal and impactful. In the days following the tragedy, Sheriff Dunning asked Chaplain Workman to create suicide awareness and prevention training for law enforcement. Chaplain Workman, who is also a licensed mental health practitioner, developed a training module that addressed the dynamics, stigmas, challenges, and barriers that exist within the law enforcement culture. In November and December of 2020, 15 two-hour blocks were delivered to deputies. Many deputies complimented Chaplain Workman for the quality of the training and the impact it made on them to present the dynamics of police suicide and the resources available to first responders suffering from the debilitating effects of stress and trauma. Chaplain Workman was awarded our Medal of Merit and selected as our 2020 Civilian of the Year. Unfortunately, duty called today and Chaplain Workman is unable to join us, but we congratulate him. And finally, I would like to recognize Captain Matt Martin, who recently retired from the Sheriff's Office. Captain Martin joined us as a deputy in 1994. As he progressed up through the ranks, he served the citizens of Douglas County honorably for 26 years, working in patrol, court services, training, criminal investigations, and internal affairs before being promoted to patrol captain in June of 2020. Earlier this year, he informed the chief deputy and me that he had an even higher calling and planned to enter the seminary and become a pastor in his church. Captain Martin is in the process of transitioning into the seminary and was not able to join us here today. He is thanked for his 26 years of service and many contributions to the department. Thank you, Matt. And with that, I will leave the resolution to you. Thank you. We congratulate him on his retirement. You know, I just want to thank you, Sheriff, for bringing these forward. Um, I think it's um, it's amazing, really, um, the years of service and the dedication that we have from our Sheriff's Department and the individuals that you have recognized today, as well as all of them. And so we appreciate you coming to the board to um, share with us, um, because otherwise we may not have known about those. Um, so thank you very much for doing this today and congratulate everyone that you've recognized today. I will, thank you. And with that, do we have a motion to approve these three resolutions? We have a motion by Commissioner Morgan and a second by Commissioner Maureen Boyle. Please vote. Motion passes six to zero. And Sheriff, I do have the resolutions. Thank you. We have two um, recognitions on retirees. Is Mary Smith or Robin Wright present? All right, with that, again, they are retiring. Mary, Mary Smith has worked for the Douglas County Register of Deeds Office for 18 years, and Robin Wright has worked for the Douglas County Health Department for 22 years. 
and we congratulate them on their retirement and wish them happy retirement. Is there a motion to approve C and D? There's a motion by Commissioner Maureen Boyle, second by Commissioner Rogers. Uh, please vote. One moment, please. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Rogers. Motion passes six to zero. With that, we will recess out of the Board of Commissioners and go back to the agenda for the Douglas County Board of Equalization. Um, is there a motion? Motion by Commissioner Maureen Boyle, second by Commissioner Morgan. Please vote. One moment, please. Okay, thank you. Motion passes six to zero. And then we will enter the agenda for the Douglas County Board of Equalization. Roll call, please. Commissioner Marine Boyle. Um, go back here, see if Commissioner Mike Boyle has joined us yet. No, Commissioner Mike Boyle is absent. Commissioner Cavanaugh. Here. Commissioner Friend. Here. Commissioner Morgan. Commissioner Rogers, Here. Madam Chair. Present. Item A, approval of the minutes of the Board of Equalization meeting held Tuesday, May 18th, 2021. And item B, call for a meeting and set Tuesday, June 8th, 2021 as a date for hearing on certified assessment corrections reflecting the addition of omitted property to the tax rolls or increased value on property. Is there a motion to approve A and B? Second. Motion by Commissioner Morgan, second by Commissioner Rogers. Any questions or comments? Please vote. Motion passes six to zero. Uh, citizen comments, is there anyone here wishing to speak to the Board of Equalization about an item not on the agenda? Okay. Resolutions, and um, we do have, Mike, is it on item D? Item D. Okay, we do have someone here for item D. It's a denial of the 2021 permissive exemption applications, and Mr. Goodwillie will um, introduce this. If I may set the table, Commissioners Mike Goodwillie, Douglas County Assessor, Register of Deeds. Item D represents uh, two uh, property tax exemption applications for tax year 2021 for two buildings um, out at uh, 175th and Dodge out at Village Point that are used as uh, Nebraska Medical Center buildings for a variety of labs and clinics and, and uh, medical uh, uh, purposes. Um, the reason we are recommending denial of the exemption is, uh, I think the exemption applications have been forwarded along, one of the most basic requirements for property tax exemption is that the applicant actually own the property. In this case, this pro these properties are owned by Noddle VP1 LLC. And the re way we got here was Noddle, a for-profit entity, owns the buildings. Uh, together they have a total value of about $31 million, million for tax year 2020, generating $725,358 in taxes. That lease was executed in January of 2020. Uh, Nebraska Medicine uh, is responsible for the operation of the building and the payment of the expenses, and I suspect the payment of the property taxes. So that first big tax bill went out in December, and lo and behold, we get an exemption application um, claiming that at some point, Noddle is going to gift the property to Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, they got around to executing what they called a gift commitment um, in January of uh, uh, 2021, and um, there is this there's promise at some point uh, to give the property to Nebraska Medicine. Um, I would point out uh, that that promise says they will make that gift sometime between now and the expiration of the lease in 2049. Um, in the meantime, currently that lease throws off in excess of $3.8 million uh, in basic rent. And at the end of the lease year 29, it'll throw off 
between five point, uh, approximately $5.8 million uh, in base rent. This is sort of the ultimate income producing property owned by a private individual. Um, in no way, shape, or form does Nebraska Medical Center own it. And that's uh, on that basis, we are recommending denial of the application. I know there is a representative uh, for the owners here today who would like to speak. So uh, with that as introduction, I will get out of the way and give her the opportunity. Thank you. If you wanna come forward. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Stephanie Nyhus and I represent Noddle's um, Tax Advisory Group and um, we are based out of Indiana. So today we are wanting to speak about this exemption, exemption application. Um, we equate it to, when the lease was executed, it was basically a build to suit arrangement with Noddle. They built the property um, with the intention of leasing it to Nebraska Medical Center over a period of years to recover the costs of those buildings. And largely because at the end of this lease, Nebraska Medical Center will own the property. It will be gifted to them um, once the mortgage is paid off. Um, so largely this is a financing arrangement. And for that, based on the activities of Nebraska Medical Center, we are requesting an exemption um, for these properties. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions or comments from board members? Can you turn your light on, Commissioner Kavanaugh, so I can turn your mic on? Mm. Hmm. Okay, try now. Okay. You're the um, accountant for this group, is that correct? We're a tax representative. We're not the accountant, no. Are you an attorney? No. Did you draft this agreement? No. Okay. Um, maybe I should ask Mr. Goodwillie then. Relative to this agreement um, between this private entity and uh, is it the University of Nebraska Medical Center? No, it's okay. Nebraska Medicine, which is its own separate Nebraska nonprofit corporation. Okay, so two private entities. Yeah, I, I suppose you could look at it that way. What I would say, and, and I will concede this, if Nebraska Medicine actually owned the building, this would qualify. Yes, my question is this agreement between these two private corporations, have you reviewed this? I have, it's very short. Okay. Is it an irrevocable agreement? Does not appear to be so. So they could run through this whole thing and get the exemption and then change their mind and not go through with it? Well, I hate to be that, as old as I am, I hate to be that cynical about things. You're a lawyer, right? But yes, there is that, there is that possibility. And, I, and I, I have to say part of my skepticism about this whole arrangement is if you, were, if you were the entity that owned the building and you were generating at the end of that lease in excess of $5.8 million for your basic rent, why in the hell would you give that away? Yes, my question is, you've read this, you're a lawyer, and there's no irrevocable. It, it does not appear to be irrevocable. Okay. No. And it's well settled law that if you don't have an irrevocability clause, you can revoke whatever the agreement is. Well, certainly. So they're asking for this revocable agreement to allow them to not pay taxes, is that right? Well, that would be the implication, yes. If you grant the exemption, they would not be paying any property tax. <clears throat> and this runs till when? It had a date? 2049. There. So 30 years from now. Quite a long ways, yes. <laughs> okay, have you ever seen anything like this before? No, they, they actually applied fairly, uh, fairly early in the process. Um, our office, and to some degree the county attorney's office too, have spent an awful lot of time researching this. I've never seen anything like it. Right. Now, I have seen instances where courts have decided that equitable title, meaning a land contract or a purchase, land, at least purchase agreement, right. where at the end of which the, the uh, lessee would acquire the property f for a dollar or some nominal amount where that's been viewed as equitable title sufficient to confer ownership status for exemption purposes, but, but never anything like this, and especially under this set of facts. I mean, since you asked me to be cynical, I'll be real cynical. 
I think what happened was uh, they executed this lease. Uh, Nebraska Medical Center got the first tax bill in December because that's when they go out and they are responsible for, for paying all the expenses under the lease. And I think they said, holy smokes, we don't like writing a big check like this for property taxes. And between they and Nautil, they came up with this gift arrangement. Yeah, I think that's probably a common reaction to people when they get tax bills. Well, well it's but everybody's I, reaction, I, I, but it's I, what I we I have did. to say, excuse me, I have to say that uh, having done a variety of these trusts specifically to uh, allow properties to be exempt for government purposes, uh, they are never ever recognized, in my experience, as valid for that purpose unless they're irrevocable. I, I point out special needs trust is just one example. One minute. There is no irrevocability clause, and therefore there's no reason to grant this exemption. Um, and I think it had set a really, really bad precedent for us to start granting exemptions for revocable trusts that 50 years from now or 30 years from now, somebody could come in and say, oh, we changed our mind. And no harm, no foul. There's nothing you could do at that point. You can't recapture the, the lost taxes. No, I, I once had a colleague in another work life who would sometimes say, if you exempt it, they will come. Right. Well, I salute and, and whoever that's how drafted this, it up. No, and that's how this feels. I, I, I salute the clever lawyer whoever drafted this up. It's, it's clever. Uh, I don't think it has much merit, but thank you for bringing this to our attention. Do we, do we vote on this then as a yes or no yes. exemption? Uh, a, a yes vote would uphold our denial of the exemption. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Can you turn your um, light on, Commissioner Morgan, so I can turn your... Try it one more time. There we go. Okay. Teresa, not to put you on the spot, do you have any comments you want to make? I think you and I have had some discussions of this sort of thing a few years ago. Teresa, York County Attorney's Office. We would concur with the recommendation of the assessor's office. Okay. Thank you for your comment. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. Um, with that, we need a motion um, to deny the 2021 permissive exemption application, if that's the will of the board, for item D. Is there a second? Motion by Commissioner Kavanaugh, seconded by Commissioner Maureen Boyle. Any further questions or comments? Please vote. Uh, one moment, please. Okay, thank you. Motion passes six to zero. Okay, thank you for being here today. Um, we do have three other resolutions, E through E, F, and G, um, and I do not believe anyone is here to speak on those. Do we have a motion for those and to adjourn? Motion by Commissioner Rogers, seconded by Commissioner Morgan. Please vote. One moment, please. Okay, thank you. Motion passes six to zero. We will now go back into the agenda for the Douglas County Board of Commissioners. And the first items is the minute and claims. Item A, approval of the minutes of the Board of Commissioners meeting held Tuesday, May 18th, 2021. Please note there are also minutes of the pre-board meeting from May 17th that are available. And then item B, approval of claims submitted for payment process through Tuesday, June 21st. Is there a motion to approve? Motion by Commissioner Morgan, seconded by Commissioner Rogers. Please vote. Motion passes six to zero. 
We'll move to consent agenda, items A through J. Please note that item B2 has been removed and item C has been removed. Commissioner Rogers? Commissioner Rogers is asking E4 to be taken separately. So with that, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda with removal of B2, item C, and voting separately, item four, E4? There's a motion by Commissioner Maureen Boyle. Is there a second? Second, second by Commissioner Morgan. Any other questions or comments? Please vote. Motion passes six to zero. We'll go back to E4. It's an agreement with Charles Drew Community Health Center, Omaha Healthy Start, regarding the fetal infant mortality review. Is there a motion to approve? Is there a motion to approve E4? I will make that motion. Is there a second? Motion by Commissioner Borgeson, seconded by Commissioner Morgan. Any questions or comments? Please, Commissioner Maureen Boyle. This is probably, but why did we pull that from the consent agenda? Because Commissioner Rogers has a conflict of interest oh, with okay. that one. Oh, okay, got it. He's Thank abstaining. You. Thank you. All right, with that, please vote. He's on their board. Motion passes, Commissioner Rogers abstaining, all our commissioners who are present voting yes. Next are citizen comments. Is there anyone in the chamber wishing to speak to the board about an item not on the agenda? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm Bob Perrin, 1101 South 36th Street, and I'd like to talk about the Juvenile Justice Center that's in, in progress right now. Um, does this scanner work for overheads? Does. Can you turn the timer on, please? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Oh, great. Thanks. Don't work. Perfect. Okay. Well, first of all, we've been asking for the plans for a long time, and we really would like to have a copy of the plans for the citizens to review them. And I know there's been some changes, so that's my first request: is that the commission and the and the board ask, uh, get some plans to us. We're also concerned about how this. Skywalk is going to attack to the or attach to the National Register property, the courthouse. That's a valuable property in the entire country, and how it attaches is really important. So we should have a chance to review that, and also the preservationists should have a chance to look at it. And then kind of a, another one is that about 25% of the contingency money, it appears to the last board meeting, has been used already. So I'm wondering what happens when the change orders come in for things that are greater than what that contingency allows where that extra money come from, and any cost escalations that have to do with the pandemic, because we know most construction is, is intensely um, affected by the cost escalations because of that. Of the plans that we do have, one of the things that's bothered me, oops, let me do this, this way, has been uh, the main entrance to, to the facility. Um, there's one entrance, one small entrance, a small door, that all of the lawyers, all of the um, people that are visiting people, all of the staff members, all the, the program providers are gonna go in. And that, faci that facility goes into a real small lobby right here, and it goes down a yellow kind of a corridor here that's outside next to the sidewalk. And so for a three-dimensional view of how that looks, that's um, what we have for a 3D drawing of the entire facility. Oops, can we zoom this out a little bit? Oh yeah. Got to be. That's that's our rendition from the plans that we know of so far how that works, and this is the only entrance for all of these people to come into. So I want to blow that entrance up a little bit for you, um, because that's half a level below grade. So as the sidewalk slopes up, your main entrance is going to be a single door down a trough, from uh, from the south or a set of steps from the from the existing courthouse area to get down into that door. 
and there's no covering on it, there's no canopy, there's no place to shake off your umbrella. It's just a flat door on the west side of the building that will be intensely um, affected by uh, rain and snow and all those kind of things. So that's one of the things that bothers me is that west entrance. I think we need to look at that and it could easily be moved, let me go back to this drawing, it could easily be moved from this location to someplace along Howard Street or at the corner and be right at grade. There would be no need for any steps anywhere, no retaining wall, no railing. So let's look at our commission to see if they can't get that done. And the other one, based on the plans we have, is a, um, a shared corridor. This is um, the detention center, is in this section, and the courthouse is in this section. This yellow path is what the only thing we've been able to determine where the juveniles will be transported from their, from their um, detention facilities to the courtrooms. And that corridor is also used by all the laundry facilities, all the staff, all the interactions of the entire facility will be going through that same corridor, which means that we're concerned. One of the reasons that this facility was built is, was to stop restraining uh, juveniles. And they're gonna have to be restrained if they're gonna go down some kind of a semi-public corridor. The other one that is really alarming to us is that 25% of the rooms, of the 64 rooms, 25% are totally dark. They have no outside windows whatsoever. And that induces trauma to the kids that are involved in that. So it's gotta be a huge uh, quandary who, which, which uh, offenders get placed in those rooms and which ones don't. And we were promised when this facility started that we would have windows in all, all the rooms. Turns out we don't. So I'm gonna ask for you to ask your architects to reconfigure this space so that all of those individual cells or sleeping rooms have access to outside night and light, or light and natural One illumination. One minute. Okay. The next one is this is a, a floor plan highlighting um, the, the day room, the little exercise room, the small cells and how the windows are located. And so we have internal windows and external windows they're not lined up so the kids don't have a chance to, to experience nature. And I think claustrophobia will kind of sit in. So, and parking is the last thing for us to talk about. There's no parking resolved, even though it's required by state law that parking be provided for all the providers and the, and the, and the people that are using the facility. So we're asking that you um, uh, figure out some way to get the parking and let us know what that's gonna be. Rearrange the floor plan, place the windows in a place, and secondly, maybe one suggestion is to separate the adult offenders from the juvenile offenders by placing the adult defenders maybe on the 42nd Street facility and the juvenile offenders, which will not be there as long, on this new downtown Time. facility. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak to the Board of Commissioners about an item not on the agenda? Seeing none, we will move to our presentations. Item. Good morning, Commissioner. Just a minute, Adi. We did have another citizen <laughs> comment. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead, Larry. Uh, Larry Storer, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, uh, Omaha 68132. I have three uh, additional pieces of, or four, of <clears throat> testimony that I want to submit. Um, kind of tied in with last week and the week before. One of these I sent to uh, my representative. <clears throat> the other two are part of the national debate that we should have, but we seem to get only one side of the debate here in Omaha, and that is the side of continual systemic racism and now we have an incident with the police again this weekend with some people that claim to be citizen advocates, but in fact belong to Black Lives Matters and call themselves some sort of revolutionary, et cetera, et cetera. I take issue with that, but they do get their voices here in this chamber. And anybody tied to a, an organization that does what they do, such as this weekend, and claims to uh, be uh, Marxist trained, 
should not really have a microphone in, in this body or the afternoon body. But one is from community paper called The Reader. I've submitted quite a few of those in the past. Another one is by uh, some, the rest of these are by some pretty scholarly people, not just my words. But one is The Little Burt the little book of big liberal lies. That should be part of our conversation in these chambers, not one-sided to the other side. The other one is uh, crashing the border, the left's manufactured crisis about the immigrant crisis, the illegal crisis. Words getting used against us every day. And the final one that we've never heard anything about here and probably should because of the fact that people of the Muslim, what they believe is a faith, what they believe is a peaceful religion, are indeed taking over a lot of federal, city, county, and state offices. But they don't necessarily swear allegiance to the Constitution. This is put out. Uh, by an organization that often contributes to the local organization called uh, Global Faith. Not Tri-Faith, Global Faith, which is sort of the juxtaposition or other side of what we hear uh, from Tri-Faith. So it's the other side of the story, but if we're gonna have these discussions and we're continually hearing from one of the other members in the afternoon that we will have that discussion, but we never do. It's always one-sided, either from people in the community here at the microphone or from one of the microphones up there. But it's never really a debate, never really a discussion. The, the two are different. So I am also complaining once again about the rules. Now I did file a complaint last week at the meeting with one or two members. Uh, this is a complaint going into the evidence today. I sent an initial copy of that to Maureen and to Marianne. I haven't decided if I'm going to file under the Open Meetings Act. One minute. Or otherwise. But I understand I have 160 days to do so. If they find I have standing, they could de declare maybe last week null and void. I don't know. A lot of citizens don't have any standing down there in Lincoln. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak to the Board of Commissioners about an item not on the agenda? Yes, Luis Jimenez, 3306 Bird Street. I want to talk about a point of order. Um, I've heard during your meetings that politics isn't allowed at the podium. And I think that's a misnomer. Since the board is a partisan board, you have Democrats on the board that were elected as Democrats, and you have Republicans on the board that were elected as Republicans. Now that's one aspect of politics. Another aspect of politics is uh, the social, uh, the, the, the social components to governance. Pretty much, as I see politics, is that when you step out of your house, you're flooded by politics. Even a bar is political. They need a building permit to build a bar. They need a liquor license to serve liquor, and then, uh, and so on. So I encourage the board uh, not to be shy about politics. Uh, excuse me, my phone's turning on. And uh, I do want to follow up on the previous presenter about the um, protest that happened at the Union Hall for the police. They had the protesters showed up, about 50 of them, here in Douglas County, in that area, and uh, placed three severed heads from pigs 
that had police hats, that well, they looked like police hats. And I, I suppose the police that sh were there gave them some time to disperse. Um, but if you look at the timeline or their motives, they were responding to uh, the political behavior of the police union, which sent out a mailer, uh, a mailer against Cammie Watkins, saying that uh, because she supported defunding the police, that there was that she supported crime, and uh, and all um, crime basically, you know, you know crime. Um, but the thing was that the police union could have sent out a mailer saying, you need to fully fund the police in order to get excellent uh, public safety. But instead, they uh, went the route of disparaging the candidate. So I think what happened on Saturday is opportunity for both sides to work on messaging, to uh, understand what is persuasive and what, not, and what is not persuasive. One last thing is, uh, is the mask mandate that's going to expire today. And I wanna thank Dr. Ali Poor for uh, listening to the doctors at UNMC, listening to her experience as a, a medical professional that one way to deal with a respir respiratorily transmitted disease is to wear a mask. Um, and uh, it was effective. You just have to look at the, the flu, the, the cases with the flu, they were it was scant. That's because people were wearing masks and the, the flu is also uh, respiratorily transmitted. So that's kind of like a control. Um, I know that there's still gonna be businesses that are gonna require a, a mask in order to participate um, and it was important for business that the city pass a mass mandate because that, that helped doctors give their patients a bill of health to return to work. That, that was one thing that um, I did notice. People were going to work because there, uh, you know, there was precautions. There were uh, non-pharmaceutical precautions that uh, the community was practicing. I hope we're not here again, but if we elect public officials that um, are stupid, we're gonna be here again. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak to the Board of Commissioners about an item not on the agenda? Seeing none, we will move to presentations. We have our regularly scheduled presentation of the COVID-19 update and COVID-19 vaccination plan from uh, Dr. Adi Poor. Dr. Adi Poor, good morning. Good morning, board members. Uh, again, uh, all over, if I just could summarize, uh, really uh, good data that I'll be able to share with you uh, today. How many times have I come and had to share with you data that probably wasn't going in the right direction, but that has changed definitely, and uh, I, could, I could not have expected this. So our seven-day rolling average in regards to cases is 5.3 per 100,000. And just for context, uh, we said when I started to talk to the city council, we said we will review the mask mandate when it is 10 cases per 100,000. And now we are at 5.3. We have uh, 30.3 cases per day in Douglas County for the entire population. As of today, I just got the data about an hour ago, we had 23 cases yesterday. So we go again, going in the right direction. When we look at it over the week, we had 101 less cases than the previous week, which was a 32% decrease. When we look at it over the last 14 days, it is a 59% decrease that we have seen in our cases. 
If you look at uh, what the U.S. is uh, reporting, they are reporting a 37% decrease over the last 14 days. So we have actually seen our decrease much steeper. Our positivity rate is at 3.5% today. I promised the city council uh, 5% was something that the WHO was looking at. We are at 3.5. We were at 5.1% last week and at 5.8% uh, the week before. I just listened to uh, uh, Chancellor Gold, who has a model where he is looking at the velocity rate. The velocity rate in decrease in our cases, hospitalizations, and death is one that he has never seen before. It's faster than we ever have reported it. Hospitalization over the last four days, each day, we had between 40 and 50 hospitalizations due to COVID or related to COVID in our community. As of last night, we had 47 inpatients with COVID, a third of them in the ICU, which means 15 of them, and we have 10 of them on ventilators, so about a half over oh, a statewide you see on ventilators and i think we need to be cautious and and everybody is kind of anxious to see that 50 percent on ventilators uh, when we look at death we have 717 deaths for a case fatality of just below uh, one percent as of today you heard the governor uh releasing the dhms uh, as of uh, midnight last night. So there really are no more restrictions. Uh, this also goes in regards to quarantine and isolation. They are not gonna be in the DHM anymore. So we are going back to pre-pandemic that you know, public health investigates those outbreaks and positive infectious diseases and then makes recommendations thereafter. So the mask mandate from the city council, it actually expires tonight at midnight. So that was a, a little bit false reporting uh, from, from some of the reporters, but you know, a day isn't gonna make a big difference. So let's talk about vaccinations. We have provided 495,753 vaccines to individuals of Douglas County residents only. 267,379 uh, have received one dose and 239,931 have been fully vaccinated. We are looking at those 12 to 15 years of age, a little bit different, but will change. We'll move them into uh, our general data. But 5,439, 12 to 15 years old have received their first dose just within uh, potentially 10 days. So uh, looking at the data and at the rates where we are at, we are looking at those 16 years and above 62.6% have received one dose. That is the measure that we are using for July 4th to be at 70%, according to the president. I think we are going to make it. We are seeing an increase of about 0.2% every day. So if you calculate it, we should be there with one dose on uh, July 4th. Fully vaccinated today of those 16 years and above, 56.2%. I think that's great. We should celebrate that. We still have a ways to go and we want to get more people vaccinated. We are still the number two uh, local health department district with a rate of about 50%. 50 and uh, the state overall is at 53.7%. And as I said, we are at 56.2%. When we look at race and ethnicity, that's really where we are trying to put our emphasis on now. We see that the largest increases have occurred in our Hispanic population over the last week since I last reported to you. We actually have seen 1% increase in that uh, 
in, in uh, the Hispanic population. 1.8% in, in Native Americans, 1.1% in Blacks, and 0.8% in Whites. So you are seeing the minority populations are really trying to uh, increase more uh, their vaccination rates. And I'm really happy uh, to see that. And that is kudos to all the vaccination efforts and the communication that is going on in our community. When we are looking at ages, as you can imagine, those 16 to 19 years old, they are really seeing the highest increase. And of course, as, as you get older, the increases decrease there because we have pretty good vaccination rates. I always look at it, what do we need to do? And uh, the New York Times just had a good article in it. That, uh, oh, it was actually on one of our medical journals. What are some of the reasons for eligible people not to be vaccinated. And I just want to share with you, there are probably five. The first one, short supply of vaccine. I would say no, not true in Douglas County. We have all three vaccines available. Number two, limited access to vaccine sites. Not true in Douglas County. Actually, when you go on vaccine.gov, Within five miles, and I put our zip code in here, within five miles, you have 35 opportunities to get vaccinated. Within 10 miles, you have 50 opportunities to get vaccinated. The third reason could be confusing booking procedures. Not, not true in Douglas County because you don't need to book an appointment anymore. Most, if not all, of the sites are walk-ins at this time. The fourth one is hesitant due to potential education. And there I would say we have, again, two efforts going on. One of them you see on social media all the time, where UNMC, where their experts are answering questions that the public have. And on Friday, uh, we have Children's Hospital who is also doing a forum just to answer questions that parents may have in regards to uh, should they, should they uh, vaccinate their uh, young individual. The fifth group is probably a hard group to reach, and those are those who are just unwilling and not believing that vaccine uh, is really protecting them and protecting the community. And so that is, I think, uh, a, a hill we may be able to climb or not be able to climb. But all the other four are really not a reason in this community. This is a fabulous community from that standpoint. I just want to mention a few things about uh, the variants. Uh, the highest variant that we see now, and it is now higher than even the wild type, is our UK variants, which means uh, about 562 of our variants that we were able to sequence are the UK variant. That's kind of what we see across the nation. That's followed by the California, the Brazilian, the New York and the South African. And I'm glad to say we have not seen the Indian variant in Douglas County. We have seen it in Lincoln, uh, probably related to uh, individuals who were traveling. But the Indian variant, however, we have now seen the first data that is coming out from a trial where they actually did some very specific uh, comparison. And what they found is that the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine two dose was 87.9% effective against the Indian variant. And that's, uh, that's good news. When we are looking at vaccine breakthroughs, we have had uh, some vaccine breakthrough, breakthroughs, actually about uh, 210 of them. And the vaccine breakthrough is somebody has been fully vaccinated, 14 days after they have received the last vaccine and then has is determined to have COVID again. And uh, so we are looking at those uh, very closely at this time. We just heard uh, during the time you had your meeting, I listened to a report that the state gave in regards to uh, vaccine breakthroughs and uh, vaccine, vaccine breakthroughs 
mainly. And what they sh showed is they showed some potential hospitalizations and potential death in individuals who have been fully vaccinated. But the numbers were very, very low. And we asked them to go back and do some further analysis. They were all in the single digit of those who were fully vaccinated compared to those non-vaccinated or only partially vaccinated. And I will bring back uh, those numbers. Overall, the message were in each of the age groups, uh, vaccines seem to work. Uh, the other thing I just want to close for you is uh, I have told you last week that last week was the day where we did a lot of sites at churches. And I want to share with you uh, churches and high schools, actually. So we were at Trinity Lutheran Church. We did 50 vaccines. Salem Baptist Church, we did a drive through We had 70 individuals vaccinated at that time. Pleasant Green Baptist Church, 45 vaccine. New Life Presbyterian over the weekend, 35. We did Omaha South with 65 vaccine Benson High 120, UNO 220. We did North Star with 100 vaccines and Easter African Development Association with 40 vaccine. You see, potentially the numbers are smaller, but they are still effective and they are still, I think we need to celebrate every single one of them. I'm still surprised when I get the numbers. So this week, we focus on the second doses in high schools. So we have Central High, we have a Northwest High and Bryan High. We also have a vaccine site set up at probation. And we are uh, in uh, serious logistical discussions about the swim trial and the College World Series. That's kind of, uh, uh, again, I need to tell you our hospitals are still having all the community sites are up and uh, are walk-ins. So individuals who are interested because now they may hear better information, they are better educated, or they, are, they were the ones who kind of stood by the wayside and waited just till more were vaccinated. Now, if it's the time for you to get vaccinated, please, all these sites are open. You still can call 402 444 3400, where individuals will help answer questions you have, individuals have, but also talk about the different sites and where they are, the locations, and the times. So, uh, glad to answer uh, questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Poor. Um, Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thank you. Thanks for the report, doctor. <clears throat> Regarding the mask policy, I know that the uh, city ordinance, as you indicated, um, expires today. But from a public health point of view, what's the best thing to do regarding these masks? So, Commissioner, you know, we always said, and I always said from the beginning, we are data oriented and we make decisions based on data. So we had two measures that we used. One was the positivity rate and one was the case rate per 100,000. And we said at that time, that's probably a measure that we could re revisit the mask mandate. I think with the data that we have, it is, it is appropriate to let the mask mandate go. I recommend, however, strongly for those who are not vaccinated, to wear masks and for those who are immunocompromised also to be to protect themselves and wear masks. Uh, it's not necessary anymore now that there are broad mandates, so to say, but you take it on, everybody takes it on what their responsibility is. So if you're not vaccinated, it's your responsibility as a public health measure to protect the community to wear a mask. If you're not vaccinated, that's the best policy. The best policy is yes, to protect yourself because those who are not vaccinated also, you know, they are like an, like you could say an open cup where the virus still can infect those individuals. So for them, I would say to protect themselves 
and to go towards herd immunity where we have less variants coming into our community. Because honestly, that's what we are looking for now. We don't want variants that are newly created that are not protected by the vaccine. So that's why I would say those who are non-vaccinated should wear a mask to protect themselves, but also to get the cases lower even than they are now. Right, to protect others because if they're not vaccinated, they could be infected and spread that infection if they're not wearing a mask, right? Correct, correct. But you are vaccinated. You are vaccinated. If I'm va and I am fully vaccinated, even if you are not vaccinated, you are carrying the virus it's very unlikely that you are going to be able to affect me as vaccinated individuals. So we just need to really keep that in our mind. Right. Regarding these numbers, and I, I appreciate um, the, the eligible percentage um, number that you give us, but regarding the number of the total population of Douglas County vaccinated, um, we talked about this last time, and it's a it's a different subset than the the number that's posted on the uh, on the dashboard. Do you know what that number is? Correct, I do know. And uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh, we are going to change it. We waited till the state is changing the data because we need to use the same denominator that they are using. So they are. We just heard from them. They are changing this afternoon, and we will then change too. But as of today. In our community, 43.2% of the entire population are vaccinated, fully vaccinated, and 49.2% have received one dose. That's great. Um, there are these reports, and you give us this one today, regarding the vaccination. One minute. And I may come back to this. The vaccination breakthrough number. Uh, of 210, uh, and based on the uh, total vaccinated number uh, of 427,154, which on the dashboard, but I, I believe you even have a higher number, um, that comes out to about 0.2% of vaccinated people who've had this uh, breakthrough occurred. That means that 99.8% effective vaccination in terms of keeping you from getting the the uh, COVID virus. Is that correct? Is that about right? And that is that is correct. And that's what was said in the trial. That those were the results that came out at that time. So really our local data uh, confers to that. Okay. And uh, we're gonna run out of time here, so I'll come back. I have one other uh, uh, question for you regarding going forward. Time. Commissioner Maureen Boyle. Yeah, I don't have as many questions to ask this time, but uh, one is that, especially with these variants occurring, do you think a, a booster will be necessary? And also, do you think that uh, Pfizer, Moderna, are they making adjustments to their vaccine to address these these variants at this point? Or do you have any idea? You know, Commissioner Boyle, you always have the ability to ask the most difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I would tell you in regards to a booster, I think what all the sci some scientists are saying, yes, most likely in fall, uh, some scientists are saying, let's just wait really uh, as we move forward. And I am more in the, in the second camp, let's wait and see what we have in regards to, we have new variants that are coming up and so on. Uh, so. That's kind of where where I am. And what was your second question? The second one, just I don't know if you have any insight as to whether these pharmaceutical companies will be trying to adjust their vaccines to to help treat variants. Yeah, I'm not so sure. They are saying that the messenger RNA vaccines are easier to adapt to a potential variant. Yes. So I that's kind of all what I what I know about that at this time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I do think that's the advantage of the those mm -hmm. types of vaccines, and so so that's why I was I didn't know. I think it'd be easy to turn on a dime. I see this almost like similar to the the flu, where every year you have one that becomes dominant, and you have we have to time out which one we're going to try to which variant we're going to try to treat. So I just don't have insight as to whether that would be 
the, the thought process if COVID, if we see COVID acting like what the flu virus tends to do. So do, do you have an opinion? Yeah, a lot of people are comparing it to the flu virus. And so I think uh, the majority probably will be thinking that way at this time. Okay, all right, very good, thank you. Thank you, any other questions or comments? Commissioner Kavanaugh? Uh, doctor, I've had some conversations with uh, epidemiologists locally and nationally regarding going forward to get to the maximum number of vaccinations um, and other jurisdictions have engaged in, I guess you would call it incentives uh, to get people to come forward who may be reluctant for whatever reason to get vaccinated. I think um, New York City may give a lotto scratch pad to people. Uh, there are also uh, drawings that uh, have cash prizes. And some people I think are, are utilizing federal funds now that are available. Uh, to give cash stipends to people uh, to just come forward and um, get vaccinated. Do we anticipate um, engaging in any of that to get to the maximum level uh, here going forward? You know, that's a good question. And I have not seen any data that would tell me or show me that incentives really encourage people who otherwise would not be able to get vaccinated. So we have a few incentives uh, from some uh, local businesses who have given us incentives free of charge. One of them is from Subway. I think it is for a free drink. And we are giving those to uh, those uh, young individuals. We also are talking to the Sioux, to the Omaha Sioux, if they potentially would want to give an incentive, let's say, a, a $1 off a ticket or, or something. Uh, but we are very cautious about incentives because I think in the end, people need to be convinced that this is the right thing to do. And hopefully we can share those messages with them. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Poor? All right, thank you, Dr. Poor. Thank you. Next is an update from Jane Gordon with COPE on the Douglas County's Rental Utility Assistance Program. And I believe Jane is on Zoom. Hello, yep, Hello. I'm on Zoom. <laughs> Hello. Hello, um, so I'm not sure if you guys want me to share my screen or just kind of run through what we have um, available. Um, share, yeah. Go ahead and share it, please. Okay. All right. Does that work? Nope, we don't see anything yet. Okay. Well, that's not ideal. Let's see if Karen can. Jane, I can share it from my end if you want. Okay. Let's see here. There we go. Okay. So this is the Douglas County Emergency Rent and Utility Assistance Program. Um, we have started doing this. It opened on April the 16th. You can go to the next slide. The program is, the requirements for the program, um, it's for renters in Douglas County that are outside of the Omaha city limits. So um, MATCH is covering inside the Omaha city limits. Um, it's for those who have suffered financial hardship due to COVID-19. They're past due on either their rent or their utility payments. It doesn't have to be both and they have an income below 80% of the area median. Um, that's about 48,000 for a single person and 69,000 for a family of four. The program provides up to 12 months of back rent and utility payments, plus three months of current or future rent and utility payments. Um, go ahead and next slide. <laughs> So here's just some basic data. Um, we're getting about 30 applications a week. We had a big wave right at the beginning. 
um, and now it's pretty steady. Um, there are 233 qualified applicant or applicants in our system. 157 of them are qualified. Of that, 73 have already been funded, um, and the rest are kind of in the process. Um, 76 uh, entered our system but are not qualified. You can see at the bottom there that 49 out of area. Those people came into the system very early before we had ironed out um, the kind of flow that shuffles people to the correct agency. So we don't expect to see that number to go up significantly at this point. We're getting them where they need to be now. Go ahead and go up. Okay, so approximately 22% uh, of the first $2.1 million has been distributed. Um, you can see that we had a, a big first wave right when we opened up. Um, that's because you know some of the other programs got started before we did. Um, and so we were able to fund those right away. Uh, some of those applications took up to 23 days to process. We've now got that down to about 12 days. And the next step, because those numbers are leveling out and going down, is to start our outreach. Um, we are reaching directly out to landlords in many cases because this program has a smaller geographic um, reach. We're able to identify those uh, landlords that have multiple tenants that might need this assistance and reach out to them directly. And then also a lot of what's going on just comes from word of mouth. Um, we're collaborating with um, the different agencies, Match, Balance of State, um, Lincoln Lancaster, and just making sure that people go get to the agency that they need to. Um, go ahead and go up. This is kind of a breakdown of where most of the funds have been spent. So we've uh, spent a total of 425-ish um, thousand, and the most of them have been up in 68122, as you can see, um, some there in Ralston, and a handful out in the western counties, or sorry, um, zip codes. And uh, so that's what it looks like so far. The average household grant is uh, 5,800. $14. All right. So this page is, I know this isn't a good PowerPoint page because of the small font, but I wanted to share this with you guys insofar as is possible because it has a bunch of different testimonials from different people. Um, when we get those applications in and we have these self attestations of why they need help, some of those are very touching. Some of them are um, kind of bring home why we're doing all of this. So there's um, several, you know, single parents who had to stay home with their children. There's people on fixed incomes who used to be able to make ends meet by doing cash jobs that weren't able to do that. Um, a widow who had lost her husband and had trouble getting those social security benefits um, because of just the backlog and things like that. And then also on this page are a bunch of just, um, you know, cut and paste of some of the thank you emails we get. I just want to recognize that the thank you emails are based on a lot of hard work from a lot of different people. Um, so as since I work in nonprofit, I get a lot of thank yous that um, don't aren't about me necessarily. And I just wanted to share some of that with you guys. Um, a lot of people have really really experienced a lot of relief and um, able to breathe again after all of this. So appreciate um, the opportunity to do this. One more up. And then, so this is just the reach out information. If people are in need of assistance or you know people who are in need of assistance, um, you can go to our website, um, the phone number 402-616-2330. Um, we are not always on that, so um, we do our best, though, and have been able to return all the messages within 24 hours. So if anyone has any questions, um, if they need help, we can help you walk through the application. Um, and then also the email help at copeinfo.org. Again, we're on that all the time. Um, we can find different ways to help you upload your documents. We've had people come into the office so we can just scan them. Um, anything we can do to help people that are having trouble getting through the system, um, you know, not terribly tech savvy, whatever the situation might be, um, we're there to do what we can. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for this. This is a great report, and uh, I think it. It lifts all of our spirits to see what good work uh, is being done. And uh, thanks to you and COPE, uh, really reaching people. 
I just want to pick out a couple of these because they're great uh, comments uh, that you've included here. Uh, the first one is, I was unable to work last year due to COVID. I'm a single parent and have a school age and baby daughter. They were both home, uh, which stopped me from working. My emergency savings funds were exhausted and I fell behind on my debt. I was living in a lower income basement apartment. Thank you so much for your help. It means so much to me and my kids. Uh, another one, I was working at a dog kennel in 2020 and being paid cash by the first part of April. They could no longer keep me employed. The business has not hired staff since then. Um, and it goes on and on. I am a, on a fixed income, but I usually do yard work and handyman jobs in order to make enough to live. During the COVID thing, nobody wanted me inside their home, so I couldn't get any extra money. I got way behind on my bills. Um, I was working at one of the meat processing plants. They said it was our choice if we were going to go out there when uh, the outbreak was real bad, but I didn't want to go because I didn't want to get my wife sick. Um, I don't know how to thank you. Um, uh, my partner has been in the hospital for 21 days, intensive care, not able to work for three months. The relief and gratitude we feel is overwhelming. Oh my God, thank you, thank you so much. God bless you, thank you all. I mean, it goes on and on, and I, it's really, really gratifying to hear people getting help directly uh, in real time from the government to get through this thing. Um, so thanks for helping us deliver that. Uh, you're the best, keep it up, and um, working together, we'll get through this. Thank you. Commissioner Maureen Boyle. Yep, just, just a couple of things too. I was noticing, thanks for the statistics. Uh, when you have one down here, it says insufficient documentation, so so 10 of them were um, not, not qualified to, to. Can you tell me what, what documentation you're requiring? Because if someone doesn't have a job, it's hard to prove that they, with documentation, they don't have a job. Yeah, so you're right about that. We are very flexible on the documentation tr following the Treasury guidelines on that. They're allowed to self-attest in many cases. Um, However, so most of those are people who have applied and then we emailed them and emailed them and called them and left messages and they never um, followed up with that. So I don't know why they applied. Um, that's the main situation. Also, there's a couple of those that the documents um, didn't match up. They were, um, I don't know, I guess suspicious. Um, so we were kind of keeping an eye on that and letting them you know, we disqualified them for that reason and said, you know, that's, you, you, you need to tell the truth. Um, so there was only a couple of those. Um, we are trying to keep an eye out for that though. It does happen, but most of those are just, you know, they didn't follow up. We are not turning anyone away who just, you know, like you said, is working cash jobs or has a, um, a lease that's like non-standard or something like that. If there's a real situation and they're qualified for the program and we can be pretty confident that they're qualified for the program, we're not gonna turn them away because they don't have paperwork. Okay, good. And then the second thing is just, um, I know that you were a, a good program before COVID hit. So uh, the, the, I know that often uh, Christian-based programs have some other qualifications as far as those who meet criteria to get their, their rents paid for and things like that. Now that COVID is here, the, the CARES money, we don't wanna, I, I just didn't know if the, uh, you have any further restrictions on the, on, I, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll be very specific. I, we're looking at your website and it just says that you offer first priority to persons who demonstrate their uh, willingness to improve their personal skills and job skills and willing to participate with COPE in assisting others. As far as the COVID dollars or CARES Act money, I'm assuming that you're just trying to help people and you're not holding them to those specific qualifiers. Um, 100%, yeah. yeah. That is, was just part of our old website. Yep. Um, and no, we are not adding any extra burdens to anybody who is uh, requiring. We are following the, the legal guidelines that surround this, this funding specifically. 
Very good. And then you said also that you're going out to, to landlords to try to really find those folks who, who could benefit from the funding. Um, can, can you think of any other, what other things are you doing for, for outreach to see if you can find those, those folks that need help? Are you doing anything more uh, proactive? Um, and well, the, our first priority was just to get through that first wave and make sure people were getting help as quick as possible. So we've been uh, sort of underwater with that until this last week. Um, and so now, yes, we are going to start doing that. We're going to use Facebook for that, um, some targeted ads. We're working, like I said, with the other agencies. I know they're doing some media, some uh, billboards and buses and things like that. And because each of the websites um, has a app provided by the county to direct people based on their address to the right agency, that is where we are getting a lot of people who are coming to us. Um, and then we'll also like, uh, you know, go through the landlord list. And then the next step after that will probably be um, some more specific um, messaging to those communities, but we haven't gotten all the way there yet. All right, perfect, good. Well, I appreciate what you do. Thank you very, very much. Okay, any other questions or comments for Jane? Again, thank you very much, Jane, for you and your organization stepping up and helping those in uh, outside of the city limits. Um, and we will um, probably have you back in a couple months to give another update. Sounds thank, good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. With that, the next presentation has been moved to June 8th. And so we will move to the presentation by Dr. Ralph Lassiter. Um, if you remember, we created our Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity uh, Committee. And the first um, uh, action item was to do an employee survey. And Dr. Ralph is here to explain or to uh, preview the survey results. Good morning. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Again, my name is Ralph Lassiter, uh, president of Touchstone Strategic Consultants, and uh, it's an honor to present an overview of the diversity, equity, and inclusion survey to you this morning. Uh, first of all, the survey was commissioned, should I say, uh, at the latter port of 2020 and uh, uh, with the involvement of uh, Mr. Bloomingdale as well as uh, uh, County Commissioner Rogers. Uh, we designed the survey which uh, uh, was uh, administered in the first quarter of uh, 2021 and was concluded uh, at the end of March of 2021. Okay, so uh, the survey, uh, uh, was designed with four basic goals in mind, and you can see what they are as presented on the screen. First of all, uh, to gather employee opinion about those actions that were designed and in place to attract, uh, retain, develop, and advance employee talent within the county, uh, to gather employees' personal opinions about their experiences regarding diversity and inclusion, uh, to gather uh, employee opinion about county policies and procedures, and also to capture employee opinions regarding various leadership behaviors. So based on those uh, four goals, we designed a survey that has seven parts, as you can see illustrated there. And I'm going to simply take you through those seven parts, provide you with an overview of the results in each of those areas. Uh, first of all, let me just give you a little bit of information about the survey respondents. Uh, 1,305 employees responded to the survey, and according to the payroll division at the time that the survey was completed, uh, there were 2,340 full-time, part-time, and temporary employees uh, within the county. That gave us a response rate of almost 56%, which is considered excellent. Uh, response rates of 33% uh, are always considered by survey administrators uh, as at least average. Uh, again, those rates that are above 50% are considered excellent. What does that mean? It means that you can look at these results uh, with a high degree of confidence in what is being expressed by the respondents. If we uh, break down the response in a little bit more detail, you can see that 75% uh, were non-management employees. Uh, the additional, uh, shall I say, the additional 25% were either first-line supervisors, team leaders, or managers, and again, uh, that particular classification 
was self-identified by the respondents. Uh, when you look at race and ethnicity of the respondents, 60% uh, white, 12% black, 6.3% Hispanic. Uh, there were other racial groups with smaller percentages uh, of uh, participation as well. Uh, when we consider the departments that were represented by the respondents, you can see just the top eight, there were respondents from all departments or areas within the county, but these are the top eight departments and the percentage of respondents who responded to the survey. Uh, we looked at a number of demographic uh, pieces of information. Uh, we considered the tenure of those who responded. As you can see, 51.8% uh, have been employed with the, within the county for less than 10 years. The remaining 48% have been with the county more than 10 years. In terms of age of respondents, 53.9% were 45 years and older. The remaining 46% were under 45 years of age. In terms of gender, almost 39% male, 58% female, 1.8% identified themselves as something other than one of those uh, two categories. So let's take a look at the survey results. Uh, first of all, the rating scale utilized uh, by the respondents was a five-point scale, and my recommendation is that we consider a rating of 4.0 or higher as the desired threshold. So, uh, first of all, just to give you a snapshot, some of the overall observations, uh, all respondents were in agreement that getting to know people with backgrounds different from their own was, was easy to do as an employee of Douglas County. Uh, all respondents across all ethnic groups rated at 4.05 or greater the question regarding how their supervisors handle matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, all respondents across all, again, ethnicity groups rated at 4.16 or higher. The question regarding their supervisors' commitment to matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Not unusual, managers and supervisors tended to give higher ratings than non-managers and African-American and Hispanic respondents generally gave lower ratings across all questions uh, in comparison to white respondents. Uh, I gave you just a summary of uh, all of the seven areas. Uh, this was my recommendation uh, as far as how to communicate the results uh, to uh, the employees. But let's go into the, each of those areas very briefly. First of all, in the first part, hiring and recruitment. Across all questions, there was an average of 4.06. We can see the questions that are down below. When you we, we look at the results in this area, those things that would be considered positives based on ratings, employees reported pride in working for the county, and they are willing to recommend Douglas County as a place of employment. They're, they're positive responses. In terms of opportunities for improvement, employees state that they would like to see more active measures taken to provide a diverse candidate pool when openings occur. Second part, career development. The overall rating in this area, 3.67 across those four questions. Positives, employees believe that they have an equal opportunity to succeed in their current positions within the county. On the other hand, opportunities for improvement, they would like to see more encouragement of employees to apply for positions that are at a higher level than their current position. They would also like to see enhanced fairness in the internal promotion process and there were concerns expressed about the clarity of a career path within the county. Third part, employees and their personal experiences working within the county received an overall rating of 3.93. You can see what the primary questions were in this area. Positives, employees indicate that it is easy to understand the differences between the various ethnic groups uh, as a result of their employment. 
Uh, they also indicate that it is easy to work with employees of different backgrounds. Opportunities for improvement in the area of work-life balance. There were a number, not only were the ratings low, but employees indicated that based on the work demands in terms of hours, that work-life balance was a major challenge for them. Fourth part of the survey looked at county policies and procedures, overall rating of 3.96. You can see the questions have to do specifically with uh, whether county policies and procedures encourage diversity, equity, and inclusion, whether employees are aware of those procedures, and also whether the county takes appropriate actions in response to incidents or reports of, of discrimination or bias. Positives, employees uh, state that uh, policies do encourage diversity and they understand the procedures to report an incident. In terms of opportunities for improvement, they would like to see more action taken when reports have actually been made. Take a look at the fifth area, which looks specifically at inclusion, and there were seven questions uh, within this part of the survey. Positives, employees from different backgrounds view the ability to interact with each other as a positive. They indicate that they can interact quite well with others. They also indicate that inappropriate jokes and slurs uh, are not tolerated within the workplace. Uh, in terms of opportunities for improvement, uh, they would like to see management take greater efforts to meet the needs of employees with disabilities. They would also like to see employees of different age groups valued at a higher level, and that particular opinion tended to come from employees who were younger in age. Uh, they would also like to see uh, more encouragement of free and open expression of ideas, opinions, and beliefs, as well as an opportunity equally to succeed. That particular opportunity for improvement fits with the concerns expressed by employees relative to the career path and some of the challenges there. Take a look at the sixth part, which looked at supervision. And again, with this portion of the survey, employees were asked to focus on their immediate supervisor or team leader. And you can see the six questions that were included in this part of the survey. Supervisors being committed to and supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, was a, a significant positive in this area. And also, uh, employees' opinions of how their supervisor handles uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion matters. In terms of opportunity for improvement, uh, employees would like to be included more in decisions that affect their work. They would also like to experience more openness when they voice opinions and to be able to do so without fear. And lastly, they would also like to see an enhanced valuing of their opinions. And the last section, part seven, section seven, looks at management and diversity. And you can see there were eight questions uh, in this particular area. And this area had an overall rating of 3.72. Positives, management encourages diversity. Uh, the overall rating in this area did not meet the threshold of 4.0. The average was 3.9. Opportunities for improvement, I've listed at least five here. Uh, they'd like to see more actions that demonstrate that diversity is valued. They'd like to see a commitment to improving diversity, uh, fostering a workplace without fear, valuing differences, and treating employees fairly. Again, these were the employees' opinions. Uh, I conclude the survey by, by making some recommendations. And essentially, uh, I recommended that a communication plan uh, be developed. And with Mr. Bloomingdale uh, and the diversity inclusion uh, committee, we're proceeding to do so. Uh, the one of the things you don't want to do is to complete a survey and have employees to participate and you never provide them with any information. Uh, and so we are working uh, to do that. Uh, additional recommendations are to do some other analysis. Uh, there are a number of other comparisons that can be made. 
for example, I simply gave you the demographics of the respondents. We don't know how those if how, how that data, how those statistics actually compare to the actual statistics in terms of the actual makeup of the Douglas County workforce. So uh, that's an additional uh, activity that should occur. And we can look at the, uh, those kinds of demographics uh, in terms of the comparisons by age, by gender, uh, by race. Uh, it also may be of value to compare employer responses to management responses. Uh, with those analysis, uh, the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, Committee uh, should be able to prioritize opportunities and then proceed uh, in the development of an action plan. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thank you, Doctor. Um, appreciate this information. Um, and, and following up kind of on your last uh, statement there, that there's additional things that we could drill down on, a, a, a couple that spring to my mind is, in, Maybe you can help out with this. Mm -hmm. Among the survey respondents, when you break them out by uh, race and uh, ethnicity, uh, the whites are 60.1%, the blacks are 12.3%, the Hispanics are 6.3%. So we're coming in at about 78% of the total employee mm -hmm. population, which leaves 22% uh, other. What what are those? That's a That's a large other category, I would say. Well, essentially the demographic response options presented to employees were those generally used uh, with any kind of uh, human resource related survey and it was provided uh, by the human resource department. So uh, you have white or Caucasian, you have African American or black, you have Hispanic, uh, you have Asians, and a large percentage were those who chose not to indicate. Ah. So none, none of the above. No. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, the disparity in response based on race or ethnicity would be a very interesting thing. And you referenced this at the beginning that there was some variation between different subgroups in terms of their response, positive, negative, or, or otherwise. It would be good to know that because it would tell us that, well, if you're an African-American employee, you have a different feeling than if you're a Caucasian employee or you're a Hispanic employee. Uh, are those findings available based on the, on the data that you have? Could you yes. break it out that way? It can be. Would it be valid or do you need a bigger uh, sample? Uh, would it have some you know, validity at the, at the numbers that you're talking? Well, one of the things that we would want to do is to compare the respondent data with the employee population data. And if, the, if that is uh, comparable, then yes, okay. the numbers have validity. That might be, you know, if you're yes. coming back to us, uh, something that we'd look at to see if people feel different about Douglas County and working here based on their race or ethnicity. Um, and a breakout of those by department might be um, instructive as well. I think at one point uh, we had uh, the HR director here and she indicated that maybe there were no minorities working at HR at that time. And I don't know how that breaks out department by department by department countywide, but it would be, I think, instructive to us if we knew, okay, Here's the community breakout in terms of race or ethnicity, and here's how Douglas County matches or doesn't match the community breakout. You know, I mean, ideally, we'd have a pretty close match, but if we've got some departments who, you know, I, I, I remember this because it kind of struck me as odd, like HR, where there are virtually no minorities, we'd want to, you know, maybe look at that and correct that because it's not reflective of our community. And HR is particularly important because that's kind of the, you know, where you go to apply for a job. So uh, I don't know, did you come across any of that? I noticed that you had responses by some departments in terms of percentages. How about, how about the, the actual makeup of the personnel by department? One of the uh, recommendations for- One minute. One of the additional recommendations for analysis is to 
uh, receive that information in terms of uh, uh, makeup of the county employee base uh, and to compare that with the actual survey results. Yes. And we could get that going forward, is that what you're saying? In terms of the data, that would be up to your human resources department. I can compare whatever data, I don't have that data. I see. But what they give me, I can compare it to the survey results. Very good. Yes. Well, thanks a lot for this. This is Quite great. Well. Great to know. Commissioner Maureen Boyle. Thanks, and thanks for the presentation. Just a couple things. One mm -hmm. is I do agree with Commissioner Cavanaugh that I think the breakdown is important because, of course, the goal of diversity is to make sure that those folks who feel under underrepresented or underappreciated are heard the most. So I don't want to say it this way, but um, it's almost like the the, the certain respondents, uh, certain folks who respond, probably their opinion is not as valuable just because they, they're not feeling the, the diversity, so they may see it everything is fine. So it might skew the results that way. Um, and then I also agree that the department is important because um, just even the one on work-life balance, I'm sure that the, the, those who work at the, the health center that are working or at the correction center feel like work-life balance is not there because the hours are so, can be so crazy sometimes. And so, so just to see further breakdown, I think that might give us a better idea about where we should focus our efforts to improve uh, diversity and equity in Douglas County. So really no no question just a statement thanks thank you any other further questions or comments again we will take these ideas back to the committee and um, we will be having updates as we move along thank you thank you next we will move to committees or we have one, the budget report as presented unless um, the chairs have anything to add Okay, and then we have one item under administrative services, but that is being laid over until June 8th. And then the human resources is the personnel report as presented. Um, and just a quick legislative, um, they are at in recess um, yesterday and today, and they'll reconvene uh, tomorrow. They will um, do a redistricting resolution and any vetoes, which I understand there's been one veto thus far related to um, Senator McAllister's SNAP um, legislative bill, LB 108. And then um, they will adjourn Thursday, May 27th on the 84th legislative day but there will be a special session later in the year for redistricting. Um, Sean Kelly and Julia Pluckert will be here June 8th to do a yearly uh, review for us um, on this legislative session. And um, Marcos and I are working on that spreadsheet so we know what bills um, did pass and you know weren't vetoed, um, but will affect Douglas County in a negative fiscal manner, and so we'll bring those uh, June 8th as well. And with that, there's nothing else. We do not have executive session today. Um, I do have a point of privilege request from Commissioner Mike Friend. Commissioner Friend. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, two minutes, time me. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I regret, Commissioners, that I didn't, Matthew, Captain Matthew, um, gosh, I forgot his name, <laughs> Captain, Ma Captain Matthew Martin, Martin. And, um, and his colleagues, Deputy Miller and um, Chaplain Workman. I just wanted to say congratulations. It's well earned. One, one of the one of the things in my life that I've never been party to vocationally is having a really difficult, dangerous job. Being a lawyer isn't either, by the way. Um, I, can't, I can't relate to, to what Dr. Boyle does, for example. I can't relate to what my son does. My son is a, just bear with me, my son is a, is a corporal or a specialist in the United States Army. And he's in Fairbanks, Alaska. And I talked to him the other day, and one of his duties, the lieutenant actually grabbed him. He's 25 years old, and he's got some younger folks that actually, I don't know if they look up to him. I kind of doubt that. But, but he is charged 
with actually taking certain members of, of certain, certain privates out because they are suicidal. The, uh, the command at Fairbanks has said, these kids are on the list. So he'll take them to Buffalo Wild Wings and he'll do these things that I can't fathom. I don't get it. And he's 25 years old and he's the kid I used to yell at. I can't relate to that. I also can't relate to what, in fairness, what, um, what Captain Martin and his colleagues have been through in their life. Now, when they go out, you know, when, when these folks strap it on in the morning and they go out, um, Again, I can't relate to it, others can. They don't know what they're gonna see, they don't know what they're gonna expect. They see some value in our community, but they also see trouble and they see danger. I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, since I can't relate to it, I'll try to better understand it going forward. I'm 59 years old and I continue to try to better understand it. All I would say is that during a shift, we're watching them all the time. And if somebody would have been watching me when I was 25 years old and I had a body cam on, I, I'd be in trouble. So <laughs> thank you. Um, Captain Martin, um, thank you for your service. Deputy Miller, thank you for yours. And Chaplain Workman, um, have a good retirement. And that's all I wanted, thank you. Thank you. Three minutes? Yeah, is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Please vote. Mr. Board, there we go. Motion passes six to zero. Recording.